This week, we crash test computers, literally. Susie gets wet and wild. And should you buy a digital radio? Tonight, we're going to help you buy your next computer. But there'll be no confusing jargon and no smart-ass salesman. Just clear, easy to understand advice. We're going to answer the big question, should you buy a Mac or a PC? And we're going to find out with some proper testing, culminating in what must be the first ever crash test carried out on computers. It's PC versus Mac, and the world is waiting for the result. The PC-Mac rivalry dates back to when both systems first hit the market in the early 80s. Ever since then, there have been arguments over who invented the mouse, the icons, the menu. There's been lawsuits, undisclosed settlements, a whole soap opera of confrontations. But actually, it's not important who invented the home computer anymore. What's important now is which one of these is best for you. Buying a Mac is easy. Only Apple make them, and there are three models, and only two or three variants of each. The basic eMac, starting at £550, the mid-range iMac, starting at £1,000, and the top-spec PowerMac G5, starting at £1,500. Fast, faster, fastest. That's all there is to it. Easy. Buying a PC, on the other hand, is mind-bending. Big names like Hewlett-Packard, Compaq and Advent make them, as do hundreds of smaller itty-bitty companies. The choice is overwhelming, and baffling specifications make it hard to compare prices. But a good job, we're here to decode the jargon. The processor. This is the brain of your computer. It's hidden behind this shiny chrome radiator and whacking great plastic fan. Their job merely to help it do its job more effectively. The common myth is that you need the latest and best. You don't. The fastest processors currently on the market are around the four gigahertz mark. But for your average family's gentle tinkering with digital photos, word processing, web browsing, that sort of thing, a 2.4 gigahertz chip will feel just as quick. It'll also save you about 100 pounds. RAM, or Random Access Memory. Most people don't realise that RAM is just as important as processor speed. Think of RAM as your computer's arms. The more arms it's got, the more tasks it can juggle simultaneously. Believe me, you can never have too much RAM. 256 megabytes is enough for your basic family PC. 512 is better for gaming and video. Or, for a further £40 investment, you'll never go far wrong with one gigabyte. The hard drive, and that's what one looks like, is your computer's long-term memory. For an entry-level system that's going to serve a family for a year or so, you need about 80 gigabytes of hard drive. But if you're planning on downloading loads of MP3s, video editing, that sort of thing, you need to think about 160 gigabytes. Less than 10 years ago, that kind of memory was the sole preserve of astronauts. Hard drives have never been cheaper, so take advantage. Follow these specs and you should aim to pay about £350 for an entry-level PC, £600 for a really good mid-range system, and about a grand for a spingly spangly muscle machine. I know the specs sound like a foreign language, but what's clear is that like for like, a PC will always be cheaper than a Mac. But that's only part of the story. This is Vivian. She's been shopping. And look what she's bought. A brand new boxed Mac and a brand new boxed PC. What we want to know is how quickly Vivian can set up each computer and get surfing. We'll stop the clock when she reaches the Gadget Show website. Ready, mm -hmm. go. First, the Mac. Although a little heavy, it came out of the box pretty much ready to go, as the computer and screen are all one unit. It was only a matter of plugging in the mouse, keyboard and mains, and after just seven and a half minutes, Viv was able to turn it on. Apple realised early on that the internet would be crucially important, and say that all their computers are designed to make internet access as easy as possible. And that does seem to be borne out by our test. Just 17 minutes and 30 seconds after being sealed in a box, the Mac is showing Vivian the Gadget Show website. 
Ready, go. So, how will the PC fare? Well, it's certainly nowhere near as easy to rig up as the Mac. Oodles of cables, all sorts of confusing sockets, and enough packaging for us to start our own landfill site. Just getting to the point at which you could switch it on took Viv 15 minutes. And it got worse. Whereas the Mac sprang to life and immediately started directing Viv to the internet, the PC spent rather a long time asking her to wait while it did stuff. When it did finally ask if Viv wanted to log on to the internet, it prompted her to try AOL, which simply wouldn't work. She eventually reached our website after nearly 28 minutes. For me, Max wins hands down, and it looks kind of sexy too. So, it's easier to choose a Mac, and they appear to be easier to use, although they are more expensive. Choosing a PC is confusing, but you'll get a lot more for your money. Join us later to see which one's best in a battle and which one comes out on top in the first ever crash test of home computers. Now, you might think that these are jet skis, but they're not. Kawasaki own the copyright for the name jet ski, and so the proper name for this type of machine is personal watercraft. Something else you might not know is that in recent years, the personal watercraft market has been stuck in the doldrums, with worldwide sales down to a third of what they once were. But that might change soon with the introduction of this, the most gadgety personal watercraft ever, the Sea-Doo 3D. You see, the 3D is the transformer. The idea is that for just over six grand, you get three different machines in one. The first position, Moto, is most like a traditional personal watercraft. You're sitting astride a sort of bench seat, and apparently this is the easiest position to start on. Woo! I'd never been on one of these things before, but I find it really easy to pick up. Woo! And if the rest are as good as this, I'm going to have a great day. Vert is 3D speak for standing up. The seat folds neatly away into the control column. And you're standing up. As simple as that. Usually, stand-up crafts have a very narrow hull, and it makes it quite tricky to ride. This one's much wider on the 3D, so it should be more stable and a lot easier to ride. However, I've got to be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm as happy standing up as I was when I was sitting down. And with the 3D's third position cart, you're really sitting down in a sort of, well, cart seat. You're so low down that everything seems to be moving so much faster. With the low centre of gravity and the ability to brace yourself into the seat, you can really start to throw the thing around. Given that it's called the 3D, this cart seat is an extra costing £600. Still, 110 brake horsepower and a top speed of 50 miles an hour is probably enough for most riders, and mastering all three positions should keep you amused for a very long time. But it's not the ultimate personal watercraft, because this is. This is the most powerful production personal watercraft in the world the supercharged Sea-Doo RXP. It's packing an incredible 215 brake horsepower, does naught to 60 in five seconds, costs just over 10 grand, and I want one. Please. Now back to our computer face-off, Mac versus PC. Macs have already proved themselves easier to get to grips with, but what's just as important is how quickly they'll get the job done. Time for our next two tests. I have here the ultimate Mac, the G5. It has not one, but two processors and an advanced 64-bit internal architecture. Here is what I consider to be an ultimate PC. 
made bespokely by a kind of computer hot rod shop called Chill Blast. It's got a very snazzy graphics card and advanced internal cooling. On paper, they're both pretty similar, but the question is, in real life, which is the quickest? Get ready. These computers cost the same to buy, and they have similar sized processors, but which is the fastest? Unreal Tournament 2004 is a memory-intensive shoot-em-up and could bring a lesser computer to its knees. So which of our computers is offering the smoothest image? Well, the G5 Mac is working at around 100 frames a second, which is pretty impressive. The PC, though, is in a different league, with its frames per second hardly dropping below 200. And so we come to speed test number two. We're in what is traditionally Mac territory, digital image manipulation. And we've got a high-res image of Susie in a catsuit on both machines. I'm now going to use Adobe Photoshop to apply an effect called Chrome. I'm going to start them both at the same time, then it's simply a race to the finish. OK, and they're off. The PC streaks into the lead, although the Mac seems to be catching a little bit of headway in the middle point. This is the bar slowly moving up. When it gets to the end, it's ready to go. The PC is ready to render. And there's the chrome effect of Susie on the PC, while the Mac is still creaking in second place. I can't believe this. This is a G5. It's supposed to do this kind of job without even thinking about it. It looks great. The monitor is a fabulous resolution. It's definitely a, a, a kinder looking image, but I'm afraid in the speed stakes, the PC definitely has it. These are, of course, specific tests on specific tasks, and all PCs won't necessarily perform as well against all Macs. But what's evident is that if you're spending the same money, you'll generally get more bangs for your buck with a PC. Join us later for our final test, when we'll find out which of our computers is easier to fix after a serious crash. So get ready. On average, we all spend 22 and a half hours every week listening to the radio. That's about a fifth of the time we're awake. So, radios are things we ought to take seriously. And the big question at the moment is, should you invest in a digital one? Digital radios are like ordinary ones, but they use a technology called DAB, or Digital Audio Broadcasting. Prices range from 60 to 200 pounds. They use a set of frequencies close to the normal FM band, but the signals are transmitted digitally rather than in analog form, which means more stations can be crammed in to the available bandwidth. There are hundreds of digital stations, including all the ones you're used to. And even better, it's very easy to choose between them. The radio will automatically search for all the stations available, and you just scroll through them and select the one you want. On some stations, you even get track information. And digital radios have other tricks, too. This Wayne Hemingway-styled bug-like thing has a permanent recording device. So if you miss something, for whatever reason, you can simply rewind the radio and play it back. You can record whole programmes onto a card, download them onto your computer and program it to record shows while you're out. So, it all sounds like analog radio is a thing of the past. Well, hold on, there are a few buts. As with many digital devices, there's a problem with battery life, which is really no good if you want your radio portable. The batteries in analog radios typically last 100 hours or so, sometimes 500 hours a set. But those digital radios that do run on batteries munch through them at a horrific rate. With this pair, they get about 10 hours out of a set, and with this, your innings is even shorter. I've already been through three sets of batteries, and I hardly seem to have listened to any radio at all. Ozart! The second problem with DAB is that some hi-fi buffs aren't happy with it. The sound quality isn't as good as CD, and not quite as good as ordinary old FM, though there is less background noise. The reason is, broadcasters have tried so hard to squeeze in the extra stations, they've had to lower the audio quality of each one. 
Another problem is the coverage. It's only about 85% of the population. And the signal's not very robust. It can be there one minute, and the next it's fading away in a sort of bubbling mud effect. Just recently, I couldn't get a signal in a hotel room in the middle of London, where reception on FM and AM was loud and clear. All of which begs the question, does DAB work where we tend to do quite a lot of our radio listening in the car? So far, very few cars come with digital radios from new, though they're optional on some voxels and TVRs. Out here, without any walls to get in the way, reception is really very, very good. Clearly, you're not going to get anything if you're travelling through the middle of Wales or the highlands of Scotland. But as long as you're in the transmission area, there are hardly any breaks in the signal at all. I can't see why more manufacturers don't fit DAB radios to their cars. Fortunately, there are lots of aftermarket sets available, including this £400 Blaupunkt, which also worked very well when we tested it. So I'd definitely consider a digital radio for my car, but I'm not so sure about a digital radio at home. If you tend to leave your radio in the corner of the room, plugged into the mains, and if you live in a strong signal area, then you should buy one, no question. The choice of stations is much better. But until they improve the battery technology and the coverage, I'll be sticking to analog. Now, back to computers. Remember, we're pitching PCs against Macs. And our final test is to find out what happens if something goes wrong. It's a world first. We're going to crash test computers. Well, Jason is. Here I am on a sun-drenched balcony, stood next to a perfectly good, fully working Mac G4. Wouldn't it be a shame if I accidentally pushed off the balcony? Whoops. Oh dear. Oh well, at least I've still got a fully working PC. Whoops. OK, this might seem a little gratuitous, but what we've done is created two damaged computers. And now we want to test which one is easiest and fastest to repair. That is, unless one's actually survived the drop. Oh, dear. Well, the Mac's taken a big hit, and although the insides don't look too badly damaged, it won't start up. Most of the components are functioning fine. The crucial thing is the power supply unit, the hard drive, they seem to be intact, and the fact that I'm getting a light means that the power is working. The motherboard, on the other hand, has problems, and it could be something really simple, like a hairline crack. So I reckon I'd probably be looking at a new motherboard. And it's a similar story with the PC. The extras took the brunt of the impact and shouldn't stop it powering up. The on switch is in there somewhere, see? Uh, but despite none of the circuitry appearing to be damaged, all I can get to work is the fan. It looks like we need another motherboard. The motherboard is the large circuit board to which all the other bits, the processor, the RAM, the hard drives, etc., are attached. So, where do you get a new one? Well, if you've got a PC, the answer's easy. PCs make up 95% of the computer market, and as a result, there are PC shops everywhere. The big ones not only sell computers, but all the bits that go inside. After about 20 minutes shopping, I managed to find replacement parts for pretty much the whole of our crash-tested PC. Hopefully, I'll only use the 65 quid motherboard, but as this is a test, I want to make sure I've got everything I could possibly need. Back at the workshop, it's time for a bit of tinkering. Here goes nothing. I'll just put the power on. If I press this, it should work. Fantastic! Look at that. Both fans, graphics card and processor. The real moment of truth, though, is to switch the monitor on. Fingers crossed there should be something on it. Yes, look at that! All I used was the 65 quid motherboard, and that's done it. I've got a fully working computer from 25 feet up onto a concrete floor, and now it's as if nothing happened, save a few bowed, bent bits of metal. Now, of course, it's time for the Mac. 
We did try and buy parts for our Mac at the computer superstore, but they didn't stock them. So my next step is to call the Apple helpline. I'm going to be honest with you now, OK? But I don't want you to put the phone down on me. OK, I slipped and I chucked my computer off a bridge. Once he'd stopped laughing, the man on the helpline was very helpful and put me in touch with the newest licensed Apple Macintosh dealer he could find, who was about 15 miles away. Hello there, mate. Um, I've got a problem with my G4 um, and I need some parts for it, I think. I actually ended up calling four different Apple dealers and the message from all of them was the same. They could help me, but under their license agreement with Apple, they couldn't sell me the parts I wanted. I'd need to take my G4 into them and they would repair it for me but none of them had the parts I needed in stock, so it would be at least three days before I could get my computer fixed. And the motherboard would cost an incredible £400. Oh, blimey. So you get the idea, really, that the whole, the whole Apple ethos is, is to buy new products rather than upgrade or mend. Even if they'd had a look at it this second place, they would have charged me £50 an hour. So um, it really doesn't compare when you, when you consider three days as opposed to three hours to fix this PC, and that only cost me 65 quid. So what should you buy, a Mac or a PC? Well, based on our tests, if you're looking for speed, ease of repair, and all round more for your money, the PC is the best buy. Sim Ace land a real plane. The gadgets that will fill our homes in the future. So you see, contrary to popular belief, the iPod isn't perfect. But what about its many rivals? 